Marcus Long. So in case you're just tuning in, I'm Kenya Gibson. I am here with my co-host, Jay Wilson. Good afternoon, good morning, or whatever time it is <laughs> for you. <laughs> and we are sitting here with the lovely Dr. Trisha Callender. How are you? I am doing very, very well now that I am aware that we are rolling. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were just really giving us some jewels and some gems, yes. and like so much just came out of this tidbit of a conversation that we just organically started, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. today we're going to be talking about maternal health deserts and what they are and how we can get into a more equitable space when it comes to the maternal health care experience for women of color. Mm -hmm. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. So for those of you who do not know what a maternal health desert is let's talk a little bit about that so mm -hmm. why don't you give us your definition and then i will pivot to jay well there are a lot of definitions but ultimately it's it's a term used to describe usually in an urban area but not exclusively a place where it's very very hard to get maternal health care mm -hmm. of some kind either by distance lack of providers or some combination thereof um, these maternal health deserts disproportionately appear in, surprise, communities of color, uh, disadvantaged, and, um, and marginalized communities. Right. And um, this contributes, it's not the only factor, but it contributes to the um, relatively poor maternal health outcomes for women of color, in particular black women who experience it the most. Yeah. Mm. I saw that March of Dimes just um, recently released their most updated map of the maternal health deserts across the U.S. and Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. um, and just like you were saying, like it actually outlined areas where black or brown families exist, right? Mm -hmm. um, but they also fall into a lot of places where we see redlining. So I think it makes so much sense, unfortunately, mm -hmm. that we're seeing the lack of resources for birth in areas where it's, you know, identified as a, a red line area. Mm -hmm. If you don't know, a red line area is identified as a space that originally, and I think the 40s, um, banks were not allowing families to, to be able to purchase homes. The, these were considered high risk areas. Um, and typically um, black and brown and minority families were kind of stationed in these areas, mm -hmm. right? So um, even though redlining is technically illegal, it is still very, very visible mm -hmm. um, in a lot of places, New York, wherever you are. So mm -hmm. um, the fact that these areas don't have hospitals, don't have um, medical providers who can provide care, um, and no access to even birthing centers, is, it's really, it's terrible. But I think that also adds to, you know, the, the purpose of this conversation, which is why maternal mortality is so high in the U.S. Mm -hmm. I have a, um, I, I read this the other day and I've now tried to pepper every conversation I've had with it. Mm -hmm. History may not repeat itself, but it certainly does rhyme. Mm. Ooh. And so that redlining, and you see that overlap with the maternal health deserts, and probably overlapping with all kinds of other um, relatively poor socioeconomic status outcomes, mm -hmm. that's not an error. Right. I, I like, I, I'm a sociologist, I understand statistics very well the likelihood of that happening is quite slim. Mm -hmm. So there is a design in the system, whether tacit or explicit, that allows for this. This didn't just happen. This is not just some freak black swan phenomenon. Right. There is something in the way that the communities are planned and serviced that have allowed for this. So Thinks did a uh, survey, women aged um, 18 to 54, and found that 38% Okay, that's nearly 40% lot. live 20 minutes or more from any kind of maternal health care. Mm -hmm. Now, that would obviously preclude you from seeking pre- and postnatal care. Right. Moreover, you have to consider the transportation costs. You can't run out of work mm -hmm. to just go down the street to the doctor, so you've got to take a whole day off. Yeah. If you're in a situation where you don't have health insurance and you're not a salaried employee, that has real financial implications for you and your home. Mm -hmm. So there are all of these knock-on effects from really what it is is maternal health redlining. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what if there's an emergency? Can you? I, I can't imagine driving more than 30 miles to go anywhere if mm -hmm. I'm pregnant and I have an emergency and I'm trying to get mm -hmm. adequate care. Um, a lot of times it just doesn't happen. And that's where you get a lot of you know um, poor maternal health outcomes. 
one of the things, and I think you could speak to this far better than I could, that I've been really encouraged to see is doulas, mm -hmm. especially, you know, black and brown doulas that are like, okay, we've had enough of this mm -hmm. and we know how to do this. We've been doing this for many years and many oppressive situations very successfully mm -hmm. and they have filled in the gap. Um, they're also, in some cases, I know of a few, I don't think this has proliferated a lot, but there are birthing centers or centers for mother, women's health centers of some kind, mm -hmm. but those need to definitely be expanded. And what happens in a lot of those cases because they're outside of the regular uh, public health system, they're not affordable. Mm. Well, it, it's, it's, a, it's a, what's it called? double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. So um, there are a lot of birthing centers that are coming up. Um, there are a lot of incentives that are coming out now to um, kind of revitalize this space to mm -hmm. actually have more birthing centers. However, it's a lot of red tape to oh, opening I'm sure. a birthing yeah, center, yeah. right? On purpose. On purpose, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. one, hugest one, they have to still be within a certain vicinity of a hospital. So if we're co if we're already in a place that is a birthing desert, there ain't no hospital, right? right? right. So that's that's one problem, Interesting. right? Interesting. Uh -huh. Number two, if the and I just found this out because I've been trying to open a birthing center myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, number two, if the person is laboring in the birthing center and an, uh, an emergency arises and they have to transport them to the hospital, they cannot claim that birth. So if that person was laboring in that center for forty minutes, three hours, three days. Mm -hmm. This no longer is a birth um, that the that the birthing center can bill for because the completion happened at the hospital. So a lot of birthing centers are decent de incentivized de yeah. to open because they're like, well, how are we gonna get paid? Right. Um, and then the last thing is insurances. So oh there are different types of um, midwives that. Um, depending on the state that you're in, um, are allowed to actually, allowed, are allowed to actually practice. Mm -hmm. um, and depending on that, your insurance may or may not cover it. Um, if there is a physician there, of course, it's fine, but it just creates so many other barriers with that health insurance um, being able to cover things. So going back to your point of saying, like, it's unaffordable, it's not necessarily always unaffordable. Inaccessible. But yes, mm -hmm. that's the word. Inaccessible. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think um, in my capacity, I'm the head of um, diversity, equity, and inclusion at things. And one of the things that we really push is, yeah, we have our um, various price points, but there needs to be something that you know, most people can afford. So yeah. we make sure that we, we just recently launched um, our lower price point for period underwear mm. because, you know, it accessibility, for, accessibility Absolutely. for a while, you know, this, when this was all new, it wasn't something that was in our neighborhoods. It was like, well, what is that? Oh no, I'll stick with what I have. Now it's become more common, Yeah, but accessibility is, is an issue. So we were proactive about that at things and really said, okay, we have to have a lower price point here. And we just launched it yeah. for exactly that reason. Mm -hmm. You cannot call yourself, um, working in the women's space where accessibility is not um, front and center right. to exactly your point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a birthing center, but dot, dot, dot. Right. Yeah, we have, you know, reusable, un sustainable underwear period solutions people can't afford it but not for y'all yeah you know, yeah. So, yeah, so, <laughs> so, you know so we have to make sure that that is built into the design of whatever we do as yeah. opposed to trying to fix it at the back end mm -hmm. because 40 percent of bias is built into the design of something right mm -hmm. and also identifying quality as a factor to put into anything that you're doing dei right because mm -hmm. when we're thinking about accessibility and affordability people often think of cheap Right. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I don't want to lack in quality or lack in, um, you know, the mm -hmm. good stuff mm -hmm. um, just because I'm paying a lower price point. I want it to be equitable. Mm -hmm. So it's available. And, and you know, are you spying on me in my office? Because this is, this no. is definitely something that we did not want to do. How do we? And that was a dilemma that we had at things yeah. like how do we get this to a lower price point? Right. Mm -hmm. The lo lower price point is 17 dollars now. Right. But how do we get this to a lower price point? but not sacrifice the quality yeah. and not sacrifice the fit. And keeping in mind people's bodies are different. Mm -hmm. You're making panties for Giselle, you know, that mm -hmm. is not how most people are shaped, right? Yeah. You know, so we wanted to really be not just inclusive, but accessible, yeah. exactly that. So I think what happens when people um, 
call themselves doing good, it's always you know something they didn't want or yeah. something that's less than. Mm -hmm. And we feel very strongly it thinks that that is not the case. Mm -hmm. um, if we can't figure it out, it just means we need to go back to the drawing board. And we did figure it out, and we're very proud of this. That's yeah. awesome. That's mm -hmm. awesome. What are some resources that you think can reverse the racial disparities and systematic inequities within the healthcare system when we talk about things that are good and mm -hmm. are going to help us? Well, I think first and foremost, um, we talk about racism almost like it's separate from everything else, right? Mm. So it's it's not it's like okay, well, something like police brutality, which is very obvious and very ugly, but the insidious ways that it manifests in uh, the life of a birthing person of color, we don't observe, and so we look at it in education to some degree. But if you start to look at everything in terms of okay, what are the outcomes for X and what are the outcomes for Y? I'm not coming in here with a bunch of bias. I don't have a, a chip on my shoulder. But in all of these cases, it looks like this. Mm -hmm. And so who do you bring that information to? I find, particularly in these areas, most people don't know who their city council person is. Mm. They do not know who is their, at least in the case of New York, who their assembly person is. They don't know the number of the district that they live in. Yeah. They're not registered to vote, or if they do vote, they vote when it's a presidential election, and that's mm -hmm. it. And you got to go be a nuisance. And I'm not saying you got to sit on the person's door and throw bottles, mm -hmm. but you need to write letters, and you need to, especially so easy now relative to maybe 40 years ago, social media. Shame is a great motivator for politicians. Oh, yeah. Mm. And so if you're saying that you're okay with these, you know, maternal health red lines, then I have an issue with that. And if that's not the case, then we need to fix it, right? So you're having um, hearings on all kinds of other things, which athlete took steroids, all kinds of things that don't actually affect your constituents. But you have roughly half of the people that are in your district or area that are birthing and their outcomes look like this. And these are X number of people that are dying or X number of people that are having this experience and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And we, I have never ever seen that case really made. I'm not saying it's not been made, but I've not been present when it's been made. And I think um, when we talk about gender, we talk about who makes what at work. Right. We're not really talking about what happens in the hospital. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm or what happens in a birthing situation that may not be in a hospital. Yeah. And so it sounds corny, but it's really effective. And I, I use city council people and assembly people very, very deliberately because they're local. They go to your supermarket. They go to your church. They go to your mo whatever it is. They're embedded in the community. Mm -hmm. And so you have some sort of access to them, and they need every vote they can get because most people don't vote in those elections. Right. And so I think that can be the flashpoint for really trying to make um, significant change. Writing to your congressperson is also helpful, um, I, especially now, because <laughs> Congress is, um, is the best reality show on earth. <laughs> but um, you know, writing to your congressperson is helpful, but you may not have the same opportunity for face-to-face -face interaction with mm -hmm. them that you would have with your city council person or you know, um, your assembly person, in the case of New York or wherever. Uh, whoever those people are that work at that level, need to be identified by organizations and individuals that focus on this kind of work and apply policy pressure. Yeah, and, and setting up a system of accountability, mm -hmm. right? Because sometimes there's just no, no uh, knowing of where things are gonna go or how people are advocating for you, and they're asking for your vote. They're mm -hmm. asking for your vote, and we have um, healthcare commissioners, all kinds of things. Have oh, you, yeah. Yeah, and they'll speak about it, but it's not a priority. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, as, and to be fair, the last few years, like <laughs> things have been a little topsy-turvy, but overall, they're aware of mm -hmm. maternal health disparities, but it's never at the top of the agenda. It's on the policy table, but yeah. it's never at the center. I'll tell you, this year, well, 2022 because I forgot mm -hmm. we're in January but um, 2022 I saw so many huge changes in maternal health and, and how it relates to public policy um, I went to uh, the Congressional Black Caucus conference and first of all it was just overwhelming to see almost 10,000 black people that are all in legislation all over the country mm -hmm. um, but actually having panels that really address different areas of maternal health um, social economic status, um, prematurity, um, what else did we talk about? Um, 
what does advocacy look like from the, the angle of parenting, fatherhood, like all of these different conversations are really in the mouths of all of these legislators. And even though this is a huge space, they're only a small, still minority of all of the other legislators, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I went to a different one in, in Vegas for the state legislators, and, uh, black state, state legislators, and we were in this room having this conversation and um, maybe like four or five different legislators got up from different states and they were like, this is a, a thing I've been trying to bring to the floor, but I'm the only one. Right. I'm literally only one that wants to have this conversation. Mm-hmm. So like to your point, like getting the public involved and giving them the information that they need, not only just to have, but also activating them is like really critical. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the things that we do with Melanated Moms is really giving people that space of learning how advocacy starts from even before birth or mm-hmm. pregnancy, right? Mm-hmm. But understanding like you actually hold the key to all of these things. And um, the people that are in city council, truthfully, they're more powerful than, you know, the, the federal government because they're making local changes in real time. Mm-hmm. You know, I'll, I'll give you an example. I had a mom um, who went through um, my Find Your Roar training and she talked about how her daughter has partial hearing loss. And she said she went to the city and asked them for early intervention to get her daughter services. And they told her, no, we can't get any services for your daughter unless she's fully deaf. Oh, wow. So we had the conversation. We talked about how to you know, connect those conversations, who to talk to, how to find your, your city council, when is the next meeting, talk to PTA, all of these things. It took her maybe three months but she was able to actually change it in her town mm-hmm. so that now children with different degrees of hearing loss can have early intervention and, and learn ASL and things like that. Mm-hmm. But if you don't have these conversations and if you don't have people who are there to, to just kind of scoot you there, you never know, right? And you don't know what you don't know, mm-hmm. right? So just having the interest um, and then having a, an opportunity to connect with other people who are there to do it with you, um, that's what changes things, right? Because mm-hmm. it's strength in numbers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Definitely. Which is why I'm excited about this platform and what we're building with Thinks with Meternal because mm-hmm. this is a place for those conversations to take place and build those systems of accountability and invite people onto the platform such as yourself who mm-hmm. are doing work in that space and like getting the work done. Yeah. I think our role, I mean, we want to fix everything at Thinks, and that is our, um, that is what's beautiful about it, and it's also somewhat, you know, it's too big to eat, right? So we sat down and thought about where we could actually have the most impact, and it's providing statistics for people to mm. understand that they're not alone, mm-hmm. you know? I mean, a lot of the, um, the birthing people, they don't even talk about this. This is really upsetting. Or is it me? And you start to gaslight yourself. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, well, maybe I'm just being over. Overre- I'm overreacting. It probably wasn't that bad. So we did a survey. We did a survey of 477 parents. And 26% of the BIPOC community said that they have experienced negative stigma against really common postpartum symptoms. Real basic stuff. Um, and 45% of those women cited postpartum depression as one of the top three concerns. Mm-hmm. Now, given this data, what are the resources available for mental health and postpartum depression in these maternal health red line areas? Right. So you can't make this case without data, mm-hmm. and that is where we think that we could best insert ourselves mm-hmm. and, and be useful. And so um, that data is available, that data is free, Mm -hmm. and whomever needs it can use it to build the case to do exactly what you just described and say, this is the situation, this is what should be the situation, and my situation is not unique, here's the data. Right. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And you have some other partnerships that I want to talk about, too. So Black Mamas Matter. Mm-hmm. Right. So they are a donation partner of yours. And yes, happy to hear that they're actually going to be coming on the platform in a couple weeks to do an episode with us. Yeah. So I'm not going to talk them up. I'll let them talk themselves up. But we're really <laughs> excited about this. So what we do at Things is we try to identify organizations because I, like I always say, and everybody, I think, is probably sick of me saying this at work. We're not the NAACP, but we could support it, right? You know, so mm-hmm. we just need to know where where we fit in the whole production function of changing the world. Yeah. And so one of the um, tools that we use is our donation card. And so we highlight these organizations. We have relationships with them for X number of months, so that is a sustained relationship. 
And um, in this case, we are partnering with Black Mamas Matter from now until April as our cart donation partner. And a portion of all of the sales of things, regardless of the, um, of the item, will go directly to their costs. That's awesome. That we will awesome. also highlight them on social media and um, use the opportunity um, in highlighting them to point out some of these disparities, not just from the data that we collected in our own survey, but other local organizations, touch point organizations that are actually run by black women mm -hmm. and highlight what it is that is working, what's not working, and what their policy suggestions are. We see ourselves as a data provider amplifier. That's yeah. awesome. Mm -hmm. And as a founding partner of Meternal, what are your expectations from this platform and what do you want women of color to gain from this type of content? I think we're all having great conversations, but there's no place where we have bring all of these conversations together. So someone's having this conversation, I'm sure, right now in Tupelo, Mississippi. Somebody's having this conversation right now in Newark. Somebody's mm -hmm. having this conversation right now in you know, Wisconsin somewhere. I don't know Wisconsin, so I could not come up with a city. <laughs> but all that being said, this provides a platform for them to have their platform be even bigger. Yeah. There are organizations that we've identified, and there's some that we don't know that are doing outstanding work. Yeah. You know, and so this is an opportunity for, I might do X, you might do Y, and they can partner up. And we can amplify the work of organizations like Black Mamas Matter, or really force our own hand to say, okay, how many of our products are accessible? So there's two points to this, I think. One is bringing all these amazing voices together. So instead of little groups of amazingness, it is a, it's a movement, it's an mm -hmm. army. Mm -hmm. And then it also holds us accountable. You know, when you know there's that many people looking at you, it holds companies and ourselves accountable for really making sure that we serve these people properly. So I love this Meternal platform because you can bring in all of these pieces. This is what I meant about the production function. This is the role of Meternal, to bring in all of these different pieces because you have access and connections everywhere. And you can connect organizations and people that otherwise wouldn't find each other that can do really amazing work. Oh, that's great. That's mm. great. Mm -hmm. And for all the women of color who are listening to this podcast, what advice would you have for them uh, if they find themselves in an inequitable space? Well, I don't want to sound um, not negative, but we are always in an inequitable space. I remember telling somebody just the other day, he's like, well, I don't have any biases. I said, that's like standing in the rain with no umbrella and saying you're not wet. Mm. You're wet. You just don't know. And it's not your fault. But at the end of the day, if you want the world to look like what you think it should look like, you've got to do something about it. Mm -hmm. And so to that end, I think... Um, that's what I would probably stress the most. We are in a space, it's not unusual. It's built in, it is absolutely woven into the socioeconomic fabric of the country. The first working relationship we had in this country was slave and slave master, you know? And so at the end of the day, we're still trying to unpack and make sense of all of that. Now we're not there now, like I don't wanna mm -hmm. sound negative, but you have to go into a situation knowing what your rights are and knowing what you have the right to expect. If you ask a lot of these people, do you know about the Patients' Bill of Rights? They don't, mm -hmm. you know? Do you know that you have a right to X, Y, and Z? You have a right to your own records and you can take those records and go somewhere else. They don't know that. Mm -hmm. You have a right to see your chart and file. They don't know that, you know? So these are the things that we need to educate people on. So it's not a matter of just saying, okay, you're in this inequitable space but providing them with tools to be able to defend themselves. And so all of us sitting here at the table, I mean, even something happened to me recently where I just was breaking out all the time. I, I have a lot of allergies anyway. Breaking out all the time, ended up in urgent care, emergency, over and over again. It was ridiculous. And the doctor looked at me and said, maybe your skin is just dry. Mm. Now here I am, uh, yes. Maybe so. Yes, my skin is dry, and that is why I decided. And there's no evidence that my skin is dry, but that's why I decided to come to the emergency room because I was bored, right? Right, right. And in that space, because my blood pressure had raised, because obviously my body's having this reaction, and I just felt terrible. Mm -hmm. I just thought I don't have the energy to deal with her. Yeah, you know. It turns out I have something that is um, progesterone hypersensitivity syndrome. 
okay. which actually, once your hormone levels raise right before you're about to have your period, in some cases, I'm one of the lucky ones, it sort of registers a, a um, allergic reaction, like the you body overcompensates wow. for it. So mm -hmm. it's treated the same way, it presents the same way, but it's not that you actually ate or inhaled something, it's that your hormone levels went up. Mm -hmm. Now, if she'd asked me a couple of questions, we could have solved that a mm -hmm. long time ago. When she told me my skin was dry, that was two years ago, I just found this out about two months ago. Wow. So, and this is me with access and agency, mm -hmm. right? Imagine if I didn't. Right. I think you also made a point of how people never think about women's health as like a, a foundation for asking questions. They're usually just looking at symptomatic things, mm -hmm. right? Just what I physically see. Mm -hmm. But how about who I am as a person? How about my, my makeup, my chemical being, right? Mm -hmm. All of these things all impact the way that um, disease pre presents in our body as well as wellness right mm -hmm. but th like that's weird I'm, I'm sorry you're not weird but like but no, no, <laughs> weird I, mean, right, ask so those I mean I have this unusual syndrome but there's always something right and right. so it's really important and this is why things is really pushing this idea of really highlighting these organizations because an organization like black mamas matter they probably would have been able to tell me where to go mm -hmm. you know what I mean mm -hmm. and yeah. so to that end we really need to think about how medical people are being trained as well. Mm -hmm. What are they teaching them in medical school? To your earlier point where right. they're just passing down the same inequalities, mm -hmm. those need to be challenged. And so at every point there needs to be someone standing in the gap. But right. for the average person, I think the patient's bill of rights and understanding that you have the right to ask a million questions and if they have a problem with it, get the supervisor, the hospital ombudsman, maybe something like that might be something that um, needs to be worked on so that you can download it and it's free and you know exactly what to do. If X happens, then you do Y. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, to your point, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. uh, talking about generational education, um, it doesn't just stop with, start and start with the physician or the, the provider. It's also how do we educate patients to have the agency to go into that space empowered and not feel that it's a threat or um, perceived as a threat, mm -hmm. right? Um, there is an organization called NAB, National Association of Black Birth, that actually created the, the, the Black Birthing Bill of Rights. Um, and they have all these really great tools of, like you were saying earlier, how to ask for the right support, how to advocate for the things that you need, how to identify, well, you know what, if you're not providing me the right care, I do have the ability to say no and go somewhere else without mm -hmm. rep rep repercussions, right? Mm -hmm. um, but you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And you don't know that these resources exist and they look like you. Um, often, a lot of um, people of color are um, reliant upon um, looking for resources that are validated in white spaces, but never have touched black faces or um, asked for the black or brown opinion to make sure that it's inclusive of what our culture, uh, our cultural needs are, mm -hmm. right? So um, in that space of saying like, we want to change the way that people are, excuse me, change the way that people are educated, we have to know that it's, it's a well-rounded thing, you know? Mm -hmm. So as a patient, I need to be educated in a different way. As a physician mm -hmm. or a medical provider, you need to be educated in a different way. And we also have to check ourselves where our implicit and explicit biases show up, or I call it implicit perception. Um, because we know if you perceive the way that, th if you perceive my healthcare issue as a threat or as an issue of, um, resistance mm -hmm. you may be less likely to really take time to do a deep dive into what's going on with me you're just trying to get me out of your face mm -hmm. right but then conversely as a patient if I ask for your help but I'm perceiving that if I ask you for help are you really going to help me are you really just looking at me as this circumstance or what you think I am or who you think I am or my social economic status I'm not going to give you all the information. I'm just going to tell you this one thing, mm -hmm. right? I don't know if you're smart enough to get it. That's also another thing. Like somebody, um, I've heard this a lot of times from my friends where they, well, this is a complicated concept. My friend was like, I'm an obstetrician. Right. <laughs> you know, explain it to me. Like, explain it to me. And so there's this perception not only about what you can digest, but, you know, what do I need to get these people out of here? And right. 
this is built into the healthcare system generally. We're looking at one small nugget of it, right? Mm -hmm. But ultimately, women's health and healthcare in general, there is a crisis. Mm -hmm. I mean, even let's go back all the way to when you first start menstruating. You can't find products. If you have products, the price is prohibitive, prohibitive. And there's actually a link between mental health and lack of access to menstrual products. Mm -hmm. That is really stressful, mm. you know? So stressful. So stressful. So you've already gotten that message that, oh, my parts are not important. Nobody wants to hear about it. And if I have a problem, I need to keep it to myself. Mm. So that's already built into right. the sort of the mitochondrial mm -hmm. of this whole cell. And so by the time you're having a, a kid, it's undoing all of this. Mm -hmm. And to say, okay, what do we do? We do our best. We have so much going on. And to ask the oppressed people with the foot on their neck to do all of the work is unfair. Mm -hmm. And it's almost sort of the same thing I mentioned before. If they're strong, they can handle it. Mm -hmm. We must never confuse scar tissue for strength. And mm. that's what we tend to do. And so sometimes we need to sit back a minute. We also need to look at the data, right? This is a unique nugget of that production function where there is a clear disaggregation between black and brown. If you are a brown woman, you're gonna have lesser outcomes, but the difference between you and a white woman is not negligible, but considerably smaller. Right. And it is, this is a real anomaly, you can totally disaggregate it from income and socioeconomic status. It doesn't matter if you're rich. If you're just black, mm -hmm. you're going to have worse health outcomes, mm -hmm. health care outcomes if you're um, maternal health outcomes. And then on top of it, and I think we mentioned this before, if you are not black, if you're a white woman with a black partner, you're going to have worse outcomes. So what we're really talking about is not racism only. We're talking about anti-blackness, mm. and we need to call it what it is. Right, and so you gotta call a thing a thing, mm -hmm. as my friend always says. <laughs> you gotta call the thing a thing. And um, the data here are very, very clear. And these outcomes are built into all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. The reading, the access to something as simple as period products, then that has a knock on effect on your mental health. That affects your education, your ability to concentrate. Mm -hmm. Oh, she's not concentrating in school. She's just not paying attention to how they are. Mm -hmm. Then the teacher is reinforcing that you're less than. And then by the time you reach adulthood, you have been inundated with these messages. Yes. Mm -hmm. right? So it's not just we're looking at this one nugget, but it is part of a larger whole. If you look at the whole thing, you will be depressed and never get out of bed. But there's some really wonderful things happening. We're starting to talk more about maternal health and mental health. Yeah. yeah. These are things that we didn't really talk about, you know, 50, 60 years ago because it was, you know, mm -hmm. taboo. Mm -hmm. And so I see the positive change and I'm encouraged by that. And this is something that wherever possible, Thinks has a bully pulpit when it comes to menstrual equity, menstrual products, sustainable menstrual products. But there are things that we do well, and there are other things that we can help other people who do it well do it even better. Mm -hmm. And that's our approach. That's awesome. Well, I just want to thank you today, mm -hmm. and you and thanks for standing in the gap in thank this you. space. And mm -hmm. you're always welcome up here on the Me Eternal platform. Don't you say that, because now we can, do, we can do the whole thing on, like, food and all that. <laughs> like, right, a like, lot of different episodes yeah. that are coming up, so anytime you want to come back, you're, you're welcome. We're thank building you. this together. Yeah. You're our partner. And... We're happy for the opportunity to we work with you. We are so pleased to be working with you on this. You've been fantastic. And every single time that I have spoken, I have felt edified myself, mm. which I can say that doesn't always happen when you're oh. either on a panel or doing a, um, a podcast. So I appreciate um, the level of knowledge that you both have and that you both bring. You're deeply embedded in the topic and you care and it shows. So it's absolutely my pleasure to be here. Oh, yes. well, thank, thank you for you being so a part much. of the community. Yes. This is what yes. we need. All right. For sure. <laughs> so where can people find out more information about Thinks? They can go to Thinks.com, which is spelled T-H-I-N-X.com. Um, and uh, most of our information is, is there. We also um, we have a blog they can subscribe to that that addresses all manner of reproductive birthing parts and what could possibly go right and wrong mm -hmm. and um, destigmatizing the period. This is something that we feel very strongly about. You know, it's not something hush hush and you should be ashamed. This is a thing that happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's part of life. It's part of it life. It's so natural. It's mm -hmm. totally natural. And we still know so little about it. Mm -hmm. And so this is this is our 
our mantra. Like our, our thing is we are creating a healthier world with sustainable products and tackling tough conversations to support women. This is, you know, this is what we're really trying to hammer home. And so this provides us with the opportunity to do so. And it's nice to see the change and wherever we can support and make sure that we amplify black voices, not give people a voice, but get out of the way mm -hmm. yeah. so that their voice is louder. That's yeah. what we are committed to doing. Well, thank you very, very, very much. And you're listening to the Me Eternal podcast on iHeartRadio. I am Kenya Gibson here with my co-host, Jay Wilson, and we are sitting here with the brilliant Dr. Trisha Callender. Thank you for being thank here you today. Thank you so much. Thanks.